glioblastoma uh, characteristically are incredibly angiogenic. Um, in fact, some of the pioneering work in angiogenesis back in the 1970s was done in glioblastoma because of that prominent angiogenesis. And fortuitously, it turns out that the most common method or mechanism of angiogenesis is through production of the vascular endothelial growth factor A. And bevacizumab targets VEGFA. And so it seemed very logical if you have a major component of a disease biology being angiogenesis and you have a treatment that targets the main mechanism of that angiogenesis that you would bring them together. And in fact that was done in recurrent disease uh, with success. The patients um, who had recurrent glioblastoma, a very high percentage of them showed evidence of tumor response um, and what we think is prolongation of progression-free survival. And so as a consequence of those studies, it was, bevacizumab was given accelerated approval. And then the logical question is, is, is if it's effective in recurrent disease, would it be even more effective in newly diagnosed disease where the tumor burdens are typically less, the patients are typically in better physical condition, better able to tolerate more aggressive therapy, and, and hence the rationale behind the RTOG0825 clinical trial. The clinical trial was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, and I think it's very important um, to emphasize the fact that neither the doctor nor the um, patient knew what treatment they were getting. And so the reason why that's important is when you look at toxicity um, attribution, when you look at interpretation of imaging, sometimes our, our views are biased by knowing what treatment the patient's receiving. The same goes for when the patients are filling out their uh, self-reports and patient-reported outcomes. In order to do this study um, appropriately in the United States where it was predominantly run, we needed to have a crossover. Um, bevacizumab was approved for recurrent disease. We were using a placebo. We needed to assure patients that when their tumor regrew, they would have access to bevacizumab. In fact, it was provided by the study. Crossover was built in. With that in mind, there was concern that we would lose a survival signal if crossover and salvage was as successful as upfront. So we wanted to get a different metric in addition to survival, and that was progression-free survival. Hence, dual primary endpoints, but the statistical design did not give them equal weight. Um, given that we have a total p-value of 0.05 to work with, we needed to split the p. And so we weighted it towards the overall survival, making the statistical statistically significant level being 0 0.046, and gave the rest of the p, the 0 0.004, to the progression free survival, making that bar much higher. Now it turns out that those two translate to a 25% reduction hazard of death for survival and a 30% reduction hazard of progression on the progression-free survival arm. So they're both very reasonable targets um, and that's how we developed it. That's how we did the power analysis and came up with a number of patients and ultimately wound up randomizing 637 patients on this trial. The overall survival goal was not reached. The median survival for the patients uh, on placebo was 16.1 months and 15.7 months for bevacizumab, so clearly uh, they are nearly equivalent. The progression-free survival was longer for bevacizumab, but did not reach statistical significance as the p-value was only 0 0.007. Again, we had set the bar at 0 0.004 or better.